another praise offering this morning. Amen, amen. You may have a seat. Settle down. You're having a little bit too much fun. How about that worship? Is that worship? Wow. Um, thank you for being here today. Uh, we're grateful that you're here. If, if you're a guest of ours, um, I want to just personally, as the pastor, say thank you for being here. Uh, we, we have a lot of new folks and new faces that come to church in the uh, beginning of the year as well as in the fall back to school. So we are seeing a lot of guests. And if you're a guest of ours today, I just want to say thank you for being here today. We really are grateful. Um, and we, we want you to know who COC is all about and also uh, get acquainted with the pastors. It's difficult as a church that's growing, that's our size. So what we do is periodically, every quarter we do a meet the pastors. And um, we have one coming up next Sunday. It's immediately following this service. So if you're a guest or have been coming for a couple months and you would like to meet our pastoral staff, our director level staff, it's right back in the C56 room, right back there and uh, right after this service. So make your way back there. We would love to meet you. This is huge and we, we want you to come to this because here, here's why. Um, like I said, uh, there's a lot of you and there's only like one of me. So you know me at Walmart, but if I don't act like I know you, don't get offended. <laughs> Because I don't know all of you. Um, so this is a great opportunity for you to get acquainted with us and be there. So I'm excited that you are here today. We're moving forward with the second week of one of my absolute all-time favorite series that we've ever done here. We're revisiting it. We did this six years ago. And I've done some tweaks and, and, and stuff like that. Um, and, but I just, I love this. We've got so many new faces at COC. And I think a lot of people need to hear the messages about how we can learn to hug vampires in our life. Does everybody out there have that one person or people in your life that are just like, oh, brother? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, so that's what this series is about. I, I think you saw a little picture of an iPhone up there. That's, if you've got our app, you can follow along in our apps, track along. The notes are in there, easy fill in the blanks. But I want to keep walking into uh, the second week of our series today. And I want to start with the, the, the key phrase of our key passage last week so you understand what we're talking about. In Romans chapter 12, it says this in verse 18. If it is possible... If it is possible, how many times do you have that person in your life that you wonder if it is even possible? Right? You, you've wondered. So I, I love the writer here out of the gate saying, hey, listen, just so you know, I get it. Sometimes you, do, you might not think it's even possible to love those around you. But if it is possible, as far as it depends on you. Now, now this changes the entire conversation. Because we all have people in our lives that just wear on us so much that we don't know if it's even possible. And if it's up to me, I ain't doing jack. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I ain't doing this. But what we're hoping to do in this series is show you that as a follower of Jesus Christ, it is actually possible and doable for you to love the people around you that suck the life out of you. And that's why it says, if it's possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with who? Everyone. Throw that verse up there. If it's possible, is it even on there? Do we not have it? Where's my, where's my, where's my tech team up there? They're draining me so much right now, but it's possible. As far as it depends upon me. To live at peace with everyone. Is there not a better fitting verse for our culture and world today? As followers of Jesus, to be a model in a very, very increasingly dark 
and, and falling fast away from Jesus' culture and world. This is an incredible reminder. And that's what we're doing in this series. We're, we're talking to you about how showing you some biblical ideas that it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, to, to live at peace with everyone. So last week, we, we kind of... We kind of talked about how uh, there are all of us that have those people in our lives, the vampires that suck the life out of us. But we did establish this one point last week, right? The the number one life-sucking, energy-sucking, time-sucking person in your life is who? You, right? And last week's message was so theological profound, it was like, we all suck. That, that, that was last week's message. So, so we, got, we really do need to understand that as much as people get on your nerves, believe it or not, you, you may think this is impossible, but you get on people's nerves too. And for you to see people for who they are, you need to see yourself for who you are. So that was kind of last week in establishing it. But this week, I, I want to tell you th- this this conversation, it's not going to be full of humor. I, 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 I've been told I'm a funny guy. I don't believe that. But I, I'm not going to come at you. I want to be very sensitive with today's topics. Because I believe today's conversation is one of the greatest omissions in all of Christianity. Um, that we miss the mark a lot as followers of Jesus. This, is, this conversation today is going to be probably one of the most difficult conversations for many people that are sitting in this room. But you need... To hear it. And that question is this. How do we continually, continually, ongoing, I-N-G, how do we continually forgive the vampires in our lives? We're going to talk about forgiveness today. Now, I'm being sensitive because I realize I'm talking to a lot of people in this room that have been hurt very badly, physically, emotionally, across the board, you, you have been hurt. Now, if you grew up in church or not, most of us know that when we have done something wrong, we, we call it sin in our church. If you have sinned, we're not afraid of that word, okay? If you have sinned, the Bible teaches us that we're supposed to confess that sin, repent of that sin, and ask God for forgiveness. And you don't even really have to know Jesus personally to know that if you've done something wrong for someone else, if you, got, if you just got a good mom and daddy, they taught you that you're supposed to go to that person. Tell them you're sorry and ask them to forgive you. But here's the dilemma that we all face today. What do we do when we've been the one that's been sinned against? When the wrong has happened to us? What do we do when we're the victim? Now, I've, I've, I've unfortunately learned this the difficult way, being in ministry as long as I have, and a pastor. I have had uh, uh, many, many moments in, in what you and I call counseling moments or sessions where I have listened to folks share with me their, their deepest and darkest moments of their life. And I, I'm telling you, I, I can't even put words to it. I mean completely and utterly damaged lives. I've heard stories of people that have had things done to them that, that I haven't even seen in movie scripts. I can't believe that it's happened. So I want to be extremely sensitive and empathetic today as I share with you some of this stuff. Because you're gonna, some of you are going to push back and say, no way. But I, I'm telling you, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. But I have sat there, and, and, and it's a privilege, but yet it's a painful privilege to listen to these hardships of life. And one of the hardest questions that I'll get in these moments and conversations is, is, is this, is when you hear their story and, and, and you hear the horror that, that they're still like kind of, you know, tormented with when they've been sinned against, what, what do you tell them? How do I communicate effectively uh, 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 what God wants them to hear? So today I kind of want to approach this as like one big counseling session. Is that all right? Because many of you are where you're at, you're hurt, you're damaged. And I just, now listen, I am, I've, I've declared this from this stage before. I am not a great counselor. 
You tell me what's going on, and I'm going to tell you, you do it this way, it'll work, get out of my office. No, I'm, that's just the way I'm wired. That's why we've hired incredible people like Andy and Nancy Lockridge in our care ministries who just do a tremendous job. A tremendous job. So I don't want to come across callous today because I do know how to counsel and I want to be sensitive. But that's what I want to have today with you. And I want to talk to you about what the title of our message is, The Continuum of Forgiveness. When I'm faced with that question of what do I, what do, I do, Pastor Josh? How do I take my next step with, with, with this situation? I, I usually default every time and go to Ephesians chapter 4. Um, it's probably, in my opinion, one of the best passages of Scripture that deals with this kind of idea and dynamic for anybody, regardless of what has happened to you. And where I believe it clearly communicates to you and I what we are supposed to do when we have found our place in a, in a spot in which we have been sinned against. Regardless of what the sin is, what we are supposed to do when someone has hurt us, and they've not apologized, they've not reconciled the situation, and, and, and there still seems to be this wedge in between us. Now, if you got your Bibles, you can turn there, you can turn your Bible apps to Ephesians chapter 4, because that's where we're going to be. To set the tone, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church of Ephesus, okay? He's writing to a church which is a body of believers, like-minded Believers in Jesus Christ. It's an urban church. Uh, it's got a lot of new Christians in it. It's very strategic, uh, strategically located in church planting. It's kind of, it's a healthy church. Uh, um, and, and, but here's the problem. There's still a lot of people that, even though they've crossed over death to life, they brought a lot of hurt within them. They don't know how to get past that hurt. And they've still got vampires in their lives that continually haunt them on a daily basis. Do, does that not sound like kind of a similar familiar church to what we're sitting in today. That's what's going on. And what you're going to find out here in a minute is Paul in essence is saying this. All of you, and his message is for us today, all of you are on a continuum from forgiveness to bitterness. One or the other. And when he says something like that, you need to understand it's just as much relevant to us today in 2019 that when some vampire in your life, or vampires, plural, hurt you, damage you, lie about you, gossip you, I mean inflict pain upon you, you literally, friends, I I'm being sensitive here, but you have one of two options. When that happens to you, you can either figure out a way if it's possible, as far as it depends upon you, you can either choose to forgive or you can choose to get bitter. There is no other way. There's no, there's no way around it. You have two choices. Now, I only really have like an hour and a half to help encourage you today. But I know some of you are hurting really badly in this area. I, I, I get that. Because of what somebody has done to you. But I want you to think about this today. Chances are there's more than one vampire in your life. And there's all kinds of offenses. There's been some bad ones, serious, great. And there's been some smaller ones, but you've been offended in some way, shape, or form. So what I'm going to challenge you to do today, because I don't know your circumstance, but I know the various forms of circumstances. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you to try your very best to apply this to just one person, what you're going to hear today. And, and if it means starting small to the least offender, try that. And start moving in that direction so hopefully you can find victory in this. Uh, and that's what I want. But as I introduce to you today this idea that the Holy Spirit um, brought, brought to you probably somebody, right? You probably have a name or a visual of the face of that person in your brain. And you know exactly who it is. And I'm just asking you with all compassion to, pro to try your very best with the Holy Spirit's power within you to listen to this message and see what he has for you. Um, I want to start with Paul's 
preface before he really gets into uh, to explaining how you do how, how you forgive to people uh, in Ephesians chapter 4 22 through 24 he starts out with something and I'm telling you guys a lot of times if you've ever read this passage or heard this passage before you'll fly right over it you didn't get it you didn't understand it and chances are you're still struggling with forgiving somebody that has hurt you and offended you because you don't understand this first idea because I'm telling you if you do not grab a hold of this first idea that Paul reveals he introduces you will not, you won't be able to ever move towards forgiveness, towards someone. And he establishes it right here. Ch check this out. You were taught, he says, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Verse 23. To be made new. In the attitude of your minds. And to put on your new self. Which has been created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Th this, this idea is massive. Massive. Let me explain it this way because it's in context. This is what Paul is trying to make the analogy of. Every morning you and I wake up and the first thing I hope you do after you get out of the shower is put on some clothes. And if you don't do that, you, you will be asked to leave our church until you put some on. Okay, but just, just like this morning, I got up and I put on some really classy clothes. I look good. Every night before a Sunday morning, I, put, I lay out my clothes. Ginger does not pick out my outfit. I pick out my outfit. So I look good. Don't give her the compliment as she walks out saying, Josh, look good today. She didn't lay it out. I laid it out. Okay? But it, his analogy is, is as every morning you get up and you physically put on clothes, you need to remember, and in that moment, you need to remind yourself that you are supposed to also every single day put on your spiritual clothes as red as well. Amen. Amen. He says, you need to always, always, always remember who you are in Christ. Right. So the great physical reminders as I get dressed is that I need to clothe myself spiritually as well. Remember, my purpose and my identity is now found in Christ. So Paul says, just as you physically clothe yourselves, you need to spiritually get your spiritual clothes on as well. You need to often, often, often remind yourself of your true identity, which is now, if you are post-Jesus, in Christ. Guys, I'm telling you, this is huge. Right. Huge, huge, huge. Why is Paul reminding them before he even gets into the idea of forgiveness? Because he knows firsthand that you and I can and will often naturally forget our identity in Christ. And some of you might be wondering, how in the world is that, Josh? Listen, as time goes by, post-Jesus saying yes, crossed over from death to life, I'm a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. Time to time as I move forward in my walk with Christ, here's something that's still inside of me. It's a sin nature. I have freedom from that sin because I'm a new creation, but I am awfully tempted, awfully often, to do the things of the old nature. And Paul says you need to remind yourself in every situation that you enter and encounter in who you really are. You are a new person. You are a new creation. And your primary identity is no longer in yourself, but now it's in Christ. That's right. Guys, I'm telling you this is huge. Because in this letter to the church of Ephesus in Ephesians, Paul says... 38 times throughout this letter reminding them that you are now in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. 38 times. 
He was trying to emphasize that now you are in Christ. Christ is your forgiveness. Christ is your righteousness. Christ is your perfection. Christ is your reconciliation. And if you look to the real source of your identity, which is Jesus, you'll be reminded often that your real identity is not in who you think you are, not in who they think you are, but it's in who he thinks you are. You are a new creation. That's why you begin to shift your thinking and no longer think of yourself as a sinner, but as a saint. That's why Paul starts off in the letter in Ephesians 1 and he says, to the saints of Ephesus. Notice he didn't start off by saying, you filthy, dirty, no good, rotten, vampire, sucking sinners. He starts off by reminding the church at Ephesus who they are. To the people of God whom Jesus loved, purchased, redeemed, reconciled, forgave, made brand new with a new identity, new nature, new desires, provided you with a new mind and gave you a new power from within, which is called the Holy Spirit. You are to get up every day and put that person on. That's what he's saying. That's why this is so huge. Because Paul knew every morning that we get up, every day that we have that's new with Jesus Christ, we are often prone to forget who we are in Christ. This mindset is vital. It is pivotal for you to ever be able to move forward and learn how to forgive. Forgiveness starts... With identity. Your identity is not in what someone has done to you. Please hear my heart. I'm trying to be empathetic and sensitive. Because I know the horror that you live in because of what someone has done to you. I have heard your stories. But hear my heart. Hear the word of God today, brother and sister. Your identity is not in what someone has done to you. What they've said about you. The evil that they plot against you. Your identity is in Jesus' love for you and nothing else. Nothing, nothing else. That's the big idea. So he moves forward. And he says in verse 25. Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. Paul is talking here about the health and the well-being of the church as a whole. The church is, 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 is the church even today, it, it's, it's a whole bunch of friendships, it's a whole bunch of relationships that coexist as the body of Christ. And I think you and I would be the first one to step up to the plate and say, you know, some of the most difficult, life-sucking vampires in my life are at this church or in my family. Right? Someone's lied to you, lied about you, hurt you, gossiped about you. There's no forgiveness there. And it hurts. No one's saying that it doesn't hurt. And Paul says out of the gate, he says, you need to speak truthfully. You need to keep, stop hiding it and, and, and thinking that it doesn't hurt and it's not still hard for you. Here's, here's why this is so important. When you have been hurt... By somebody in your life or in some relationship. Do you know what the easiest thing to do is? Nothing. Nothing. So when someone comes to you a couple weeks pass by and they're like, are you okay about what happened? You, your default response is, it, it's not a big deal. That, that was in the past. But I'm here to tell you that if you are still bothered by it, if you are still hurt by it, it's not in the past. It's in the present. It hasn't gone away. So you need to stop saying it's no big deal because guess what? When you say that, that diminishes the work of Jesus Christ and what he wants to do in it. And here's what I would challenge you by, by saying if, if it really hurt that bad and you can't let go of it and it does diminish the work of Jesus Christ, if somebody sinned against you, and it's no big deal, then why in the world did Jesus Christ die for it? 
This passage is saying we need to be honest. We need to be truthful. We don't need to say it's not a big deal. We need to say it is a big deal. It really did hurt. And it starts here. Don't do nothing. Do something about it. If someone's hurt you and they haven't come to you, then go to them and say, listen, what you did hurt me. It does bother me. He goes on and he says this in verse 26. In your anger, do not sin. Now, a lot of people might push back and say this. Some Christians, they shouldn't get angry. That is an absolute no-no. Christians in anger should not even be connected with one another. But I would push back and tell you this. Did you know that anger is actually one of the emotions of God? God actually does get angry. His son Jesus Christ got angry in the temple. So what I'm saying is this. Anger is okay and it's the right response. Ready? Get this now. To sin. Let me break that down for you. Many statistics say this. This is mind-blowing to me. But one in out of every three to four women is a sexual assault victim today. Which basically means many women that are sitting in this room, 33%-ish, have had lots of things done to you, bad things done to you by men who are supposed to love and protect you. By husbands, by fathers by brothers, by uncles, by boyfriends. So when you hear that a woman has been violated in such a way, I'm here to tell you, you should get angry about that. Because when you're angry and feeling angry, you're just feeling something that God also feels. I'd even go as far as saying this, that if you look at some of the injustices, clear, blatant injustices in our world today, and it doesn't anger you, man, I would worry on whether or not I know Jesus Christ personally. Just letting you know that. So what this verse is saying is, anger in itself is not a sin. But anger, you do need to know this, it's both and. But anger is a powerful enough emotion that can lead you into sin. If we don't, like Paul said, control our anger. This verse is giving you the permission to feel angry if you've been lied about, cheated on, gossiped about, physically or emotionally hurt by someone. But Paul says, listen, it's okay to feel that, but in your anger, don't sin. You know what he's saying by this? He says, when you get angry, when a vampire sucks the life out of you day after day, it's okay to be angry about it. But don't go back to your old nature. Because this morning you should have got up and put on, once again, your new nature. Because now you're a new creation who's what? In Christ. Paul goes on. Ephesians 4, 26 through B. Oh, through B. 4, 26, second half, B. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Try applying that if you're married. <laughs> Can I not get an amen? Right? Yeah. You've already violated. You've let your, you've let your anger control you. And now you're, you're like, we've gone to bed a, a month angry at one another. What Paul is saying here is this. When you and I have these emotions about somebody that has hurt us, these anger emotions, he's saying this. I promise you, the longer you wait to make it right, the worse it can get. That's right. Mm-hmm. And when you and I have been hurt deep enough, let's, 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 Let's be honest. One of the hardest things to do is letting go of it. So what Paul is insinuating here is this. This is very, very dangerous. Very, very, you're playing with fire. If this is you and you feel this way, before you will even recognize or know it, if you don't deal with it, your life is on a path of destruction. And some of us are pushing back like, wait a minute, I'm the one that got offended. 
This happened to me, and I'm telling you with all love and compassion this morning, this message is just as much for you as it is for those that have offended you. This is dangerous. He's saying you should make this a sense of urgency to make things right. Both ways. You hurt someone or they hurt you. And then he goes on and he says this in in verse 27. And don't give the devil a foothold. You need to understand something today, brothers and sisters. If no one's ever told you this, I'll tell you today. There are very few things that Satan loves more than a bitter believer. Very few things that Satan loves more than a bitter believer. Do you know why? Because when he gets a bitter believer, he begins to influence and empower their words. He begins to influence and empower their deeds. But you need to know this. If you are a born-again follower of Jesus Christ... Satan has no power over you except for the power that you let him have. You you have to know this. And bitterness is giving him access. It's like you're unlocking the door to this unresolved conflict and saying, Satan, anytime, come on and let's talk about it. And people will push back. I've, I've heard this. And they'll say, listen, I have the right... I have the right to hurt because they hurt me. And I'm not going to argue that. But I'm telling you that if you don't deal with it, if you keep saying this over and over and over, you will quickly begin to develop the wrong spirit and wrong attitude. And you are inviting, you are inviting Satan into your words and your actions. And it will ultimately escalate to the point of dividing people. Dividing people. Mm. I, I, th- this is a hard one because I know I'm talking to people that have been damaged severely. So I want to be sensitive with this. I really do. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do if this is you. If at all possible, through the word of God, through the spirit of a living God... Try as much as you can to just move past that hurt, that offense, just just this much. Just this much. And come to the realization that somebody's behind that hurt. And you don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So it means it's not the person that did it to you. It's the enemy that did it to you through that person because they were willing to be used by that person. And try your best to to keep that hurt from escalating. Because I'm telling you right now, as much as you hate that person, that vampire that did that to you, if you allow Satan to have a foothold and grow in your bitterness, it is only a matter of time, I promise you, it is only a matter of time before you start hurting people too. Because nobody in the world, nobody, I've been in this business long enough, Nobody in the world hurts people more than hurt people. Nobody. Nobody. Paul continues. It's a fun message, isn't it? (laughs) We haven't even gotten to the hard part yet. I know, it's coming. Get excited. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer but must work. Keywords, but must work. Doing something useful with their hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. This is basically referring and talking to this. When you've been sinned against, when you've been hurt, maybe it's time that you just roll your sleeves up and work at it. There's no easy fixes. When we're sinned against, when we're hurt and we're frustrated, listen, there's something that that sometimes rises up in us, right? We get like this newfound boldness, like, dude, you want a piece of me, right? And we react, We react, and some of us react in different ways. You know what's tragic when someone has hurt you so deeply, so badly? Do you know what many people do? They go get a drink. Many people go pop a pill. 
Many people go do damaging things to themselves because they've been damaged themselves. Many people, many people go gossip about it. And Paul is saying right here, remember? Do, do you remember? New habits. New patterns. Because you are a new creation. No one's saying the hurt wasn't bad and it didn't hurt. But why are you going and hurting yourself and hurting other people? Right. You are a new person in Christ. So you need to work, work, work. Whoa, 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 whoa. You know what I'm saying? You need to work on new responses to the old frustrations. He goes on, verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Ugh. Paul says this because he knows that when we're sinned against, when we're hurt, it's really hard to keep a tight hold on your tongue. And when we begin to attack with words, do you understand the power of words? Proverbs put it into context and he said this. This is the power in words. It is like thrusting a sword into someone and destroying them. Keep thinking, keep thinking. New person, new person, new person, new person. In Christ, in Christ. Be like Jesus, and what would he say in this moment? So Paul continues, and he tells us, these are the words of a new created person, of someone in Christ. But only what is helpful for building up others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. When you've been hurt, sinned against, we tend to use words as like this natural mechanism to defend ourselves. And Paul's saying, no, think like Jesus here. Think like Jesus, new creation in Christ. What could you say to that person that's hurt you that could help them? Now, this is where many of us are like, huh? No, sir. I ain't going there. That is not, no way. You have no idea. No, 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 no. You're pushing back. But Paul's saying this is where you must remind yourself. You are a new person. You are a new creation. Th Listen, I'm being honest. This is a tough one, right? When someone that has hurt you, the predator that has hurt you, you are a victim. No, no way possible. Because if you're anything like me, I'm a counter puncher. If you punch me, guess what? I'm going to punch you twice. That, that, that's, that's, the natural, that's the natural defense mechanism. But Paul is actually implying that if this, this predator, this vampire hits me. Did you see that? You want to do it again? I am supposed to do this, according to Paul. You just punched me. I'm going to pray for you. Amen. Come on. <laughs> Who's buying that? Yes. Nobody buying it? Because yes. you're like, no, 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 no. That, that can't do it. Because your old nature rises up, and you're like, I am going to kill them. That's why I would tell you this idea that Paul is implying right here about forgiveness, no joke. It takes a miracle. It takes a miracle. It's you reminding yourself that I am a new person, a new creation in Christ. And because my old nature is still existent in me, I am not going to be able to do this. But the Holy Spirit who is in my new person, because I am in Christ, is capable of doing this in and through me. It takes a mirror. I just was talking to Ginger this week about this whole message and a couple key ideas, this one and another one, that it's like, if someone has been sexually abused as a child for years and years, how is that even possible? But it is. 
if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And as a follower of Jesus, because I am a new person in Christ, it is possible, but not by my might, but by the Holy Spirit's might within me. And then this is where I would challenge you and say, if God is in the miracle working business and you are refusing because of what's happened to you, I do get it. I get why and how you feel that way. But do you realize what you're doing? You, you, are, you are keeping God from performing a miracle in and through you, wouldn't you want to be a part of the miracle equations of God? And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We all have a tendency of saying, I, ca I cannot love them, I cannot forgive them. Yes, you can. According to the word of God, yes, you can, but it will take a miracle. Through the Holy Spirit, who is now, remember, remember, in you, because you are a new creation. You're not doing anything in this matter. It's God doing something in you and through you. Then Paul continues, the hardest words of all. Hard words for somebody to hear today. These are going to be the hardest words you hear. But I need to tell you something. I believe soft words produce hard people, but I think hard words produce soft words, soft people. And I believe the Bible is filled with over and over and over hard words so it will make soft people. So this is for you today. It says in verse 31, get rid of all bitterness. When someone sins against you, and they will, and they have, you have two options, remember? Forgiveness or bitterness. And some of you are out there, and you would push back and say, well, I didn't choose bitterness with that tone in your voice. <laughs> and I've had people say, I didn't choose bitterness. I didn't choose for this to happen to me. I didn't choose bitterness. And lovingly and compassionately, I look at them and say this, but if you haven't chosen forgiveness, you have chosen bitterness. Bitterness basically means this, friends. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. And you'll push back and say, well, you don't know what that person did to me. It really, really, really hurt me so badly. And I am not saying that it didn't. But if you allow yourself to keep thinking about it, you will well up with emotion and it will oftentimes, many times, most times, all the time manifest itself in the form of bitterness. And let me say this about bitterness today. Listen closely. I think it's going to be on the screens and I'll unpack it. This is about bitterness. It usually has less to do with the magnitude of the offense and more to do with the proximity of the offender. It usually has less to do with the magnitude of the offense and more to do with the proximity of the offender. What do you mean by that? Guys, while you're at church today, someone could break into your house and clean you out. You don't have a clue of who they are, a complete stranger. They clean you out. Yes, it's devastating. It hurts. you got to rebuild. But in 10 years from now, you're not thinking about it. It's over. It's done. You, your house got broken in one time, right? But let's say it's someone close to you, right, that, 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 that basically your husband, your wife, your daughter, close to you, they've done something that really, really, really hurts you. And years go by. And if it's left undealt with, you will find yourself often, what, doing Playing it over and over and over and over in your mind. You cannot move on. Why is that the case, Josh? Why, why can't I move on because of what my uncle did to me? Why is that? Because I'm telling you, bitterness usually has less to do with the magnitude of the offense and more to do with the proximity of the offender. Now you're out there and you're like, okay, I'm buying. What else you got? What do you mean? How do I know if I'm bitter, Josh? How do I know if I'm bitter? Do you keep thinking about it? Do you have the tendency to bring it up often and talk about it? 
Does it emotionally still affect you? Is it something that you can remember the exact details about? If that's you, you're bitter. Bitter people are like archaeologists. They're always digging up the past. So Paul says, get rid of all bitterness. So some of us, we think, I'm not bitter because I've put it in the boundaries like you talked about last week. I've, I've pushed it out of, of my relationship. I've trimmed the trees. I've, you know, mowed the grass, this, whatever. I, I've kind of put into place these things. And you don't think you're bitter anymore, but yet you can still remember everything and you cannot let it go. And that's because you have not gotten rid of all bitterness. The writer of Hebrews tells us you can't prune, trim, mow back, push back bitterness. You must dig the root of bitterness up. And how do you do that? Well, the Bible makes it very clear. The only way to get rid of all bitterness, to dig the root of bitterness up in your life, is to use the shovel of forgiveness. That's why I'm telling you, friends, many of you, you'll move to a new town because somebody hurt you, your neighbor, close friend. You'll, you'll, you'll get a new marriage. You'll get a new job. You'll move to a new church because of something I said that offended you. But I'm telling you, it will never work. Because if you did not dig up the root of forgiveness with the sho- or the root of bitterness with the shovel forgiveness, <laughs> bitterness always has a nasty way of finding itself manifested back in your life. Then Paul, Paul says these are some byproducts of bitterness in your life: rage, anger, brawling, slander along with every form of malice. You know what malice means? It's out of control, no holds barred. It is a wildfire. It's a lose-lose scenario. Listen, friends, if you can't, don't, won't dig up the root of bitterness with a shovel of forgiveness, you know what you're doing? You're falling back to your old way of life, and you're forgetting that you are a new person, new creation in Christ. That's why bitterness grieves the Holy Spirit because you are rendering the Holy Spirit incapacitated in your life. You're not allowing the Holy Spirit to do the miracle, the miracle that it's going to take for you to move on and forgive. So you're sitting out there saying, well, Josh, how in the world do I do that? I have no clue. We're out of time. So good luck on that. (laughs) Guys, uh, this takes another miracle. This takes another miracle. Because we know the hardest people to be kind and compassionate to are the ones that have sinned against us, right? So, because it takes another miracle, let's just close with this. All right, well, talk to me about that forgiving each other. What does that look like? How do I start to dig up the root of bitterness in my life with the shovel of forgiveness. Se- seven quick things, ready? And I'm done. Here's the first one if you're a note taker. Th- this is what it looks like. Canceling a debt. It means you look at that person that has hurt you, damaged you, and you say, I'm not going to make you pay me back for this. You owe me a lot. Many, many years in my childhood. But I'm not going to make you pay me back. Here's number two. Removing that person's control over you, which basically is you saying, I'm, I'm letting this go once and for all. I'm done. You need to understand, number three, that this is not only a gift for them, but it's a gift for you. Amen. Right? I'm giving you freedom from this, and in turn, I am freeing myself. Number four, forsaking a revenge. Which basically means that thought in your brain that you've been thinking all the time, it needs to go. And you need to look at them and you say, I'm not, I'm not going to get you back, sucker. You can add the word sucker. That's good. I'm good. (laughs) I'm not going to get you back. Number five. How about this one? This is hard kind of because you got to let go of control. Leaving ultimate justice up to God. 
whether or not you let this go, you tell them, I am. I am going to let this go. And I'm going to go ahead and leave the results up to God. Someone walked out of church today and they said, what do you do about you've forgiven somebody for what they've done to you, but they will not forgive you? Leave the ultimate justice up to God. If you've done what God has told you to do, there's nothing else you need to do. You've dug up that root of bitterness in you. This is both a decision and a process. That's number six. Saying this, I'm moving forward. I'm done. I'm moving forward with my new creation in Christ. This is a decision and a process. And this is the toughest one. This is the hardest one of the seven. Ready? Getting to a place in which you genuinely want good for them. Whoa, you have crossed over the line. You are now that vampire that has offended me today, Josh. How dare you say that about forgiveness? That I genuinely want good to the person that abused me as a child? Are you kidding me? Honestly, friends, I'm telling you, I told you already, it, it takes a miracle. But you have to dig up the root of bitterness with the shovel of forgiveness. And the only way that you can do that fully, completely, is getting to the point in which you genuinely want good with it. Now listen, notice I didn't say you have to do life with them. Boundaries are biblical. That's right. But it gets to the place in which you want that person that offended you, maybe just maybe to come to know Jesus Christ. And you might be the tool that God wants to use in that. That's hard. But I'm here to tell you this, friends, as you think about these, that you genuinely want good for them. With all sensitivity and empathy today, I know you've been hurt and you've, some of you, you shouldn't even be sitting in church today because you're so angry and have been angry at God for the longest time. Can I just tell you this as you think about those seven things? Let me remind you that nobody in the history of mankind has ever been sinned more against than God. Nobody. Even your story, as horrific and traumatizing as it is, it, it doesn't even make the same page as much as God has been offended and sinned against. And I don't know about you, but aren't you glad that God chose forgiveness for you instead of bitterness? Aren't you glad he's not sitting up there leaning over onto the throne of his father, Jesus is, and they're like making this list of malice? I'm gonna get them back, sucker. Nobody in the history of human, our God, our great savior humbled himself. He became a man and he sinned not, but was sinned against greatly. And he came to make us not enemies, but friends. To offer us forgiveness, not bitterness. And one of the most amazing things, one of the most amazing things in my mind is to think about the last moments of Jesus Christ, where he's hanging on a cross, dying for your sins, my sins, our offenses against him. And in his dying moments, he looks to his right and he sees a man that deserves to be on the same cross that he's on and doesn't deserve to be. And what does he choose in his dying moments? I forgive you. And then he extends it to the whole crowd, beaten, broken, bruised, bleeding, dying for you and for me. They're mocking, crying out. They called for this crucifixion. They called for this murder. And he, he yells out one last time, right? Father, forgive them. That's Jesus, Josh. No, 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 no. You are a new creation in Christ, Amen. capable of doing the same thing. Would you stand to your feet?
your heads bowed and eyes closed. Here's what we're going to do today. Don't cut me off. Please don't cut me off. I'm going to meet people today that maybe have come to the point of realizing. Look at me real quick. You don't have to bow your heads. I'm going to come right down here. I'm going to meet you halfway. I think a couple people did in the first service. But if you're here today and you realize, I, I don't have that new creature in me. I don't have that new creation. I've never crossed over and I've never received God's forgiveness of me. But you want to be made right in God's eyes. You want to move forward with that victory in Christ. I'm going to meet you here. I love nothing more than to introduce you to Jesus Christ and help you cross over from death to life. Be right here during this closing song. For those of you that are out there and you've been wronged, today you've also been warned what the Bible says you need to do to make things right, to forgive. Maybe you're the one that's offended somebody else. You've hurt them. You, you know what you've been know what you need to do. So what I thought I'd do today, this would be a perfect time. Let's just pour pour some salt in the wound and let's celebrate communion on this message today, right? Let's remember Christ's ultimate sacrifice in the form of forgiveness for our sins against him. And in 1 Corinthians, when it talks about this, it talks about observing communion. You know what it says? It says very powerful words, cautious words. Don't do it unworthily. You know what that means? That means if you don't know Jesus, why are you remembering something that you haven't even claimed in your own life? That's first and foremost. That's why salvation. And if you have sin in your heart, bitterness in your heart, which means basically there's like three people that are going to do communion today. (laughs) No, it says make it right. We got some counselors are going to be up here praying. They're willing to pray with you, but hit your knees. Hit your knees. And if you want to know Jesus Christ today as your personal Lord and Savior, I'll be down here to meet you. I'll be down here to meet you. It's really cool. Everybody goes this way. You just go this way. You're meeting with the pastor. Okay? And we'll introduce you to Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray for us today, and we're going to do that. Just a quick reminder. Listen, hey, we're kind of under some rules with, with meeting here Take, get, get, get your heart ready before you get up to the top step because you got to take the communion on the stage. Can't take it back out there, okay? So just, 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 just remember that. Just we want to be respectful to our, we don't, we don't want to grow in bitterness to the public school system, okay? So, so let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you. Move today in someone's life. You're a good God. Somebody today wants to cross over from death to life. Somebody did it in the first service, which is awesome. Some people need to move forward today, and they are so excited to dig up the root of bitterness with the shovel of forgiveness, and today is the day that they want to do it. God, help us remember. Help us remember today as we celebrate communion.